Hey, CGB. What's up, Arjuna P? Uh, we are here with another week of magic. And this week, uh, we have a special guest who's showing up on the podcast today. It is none other than the legendary, he really is a legend in the magic community, Michael J. Flores. Um, we were fortunate enough to have Covert Go Blue kind of uh, start up a dialogue with him. And he is showing up on the podcast today. Are you stoked, CGB? I don't think I could be much more excited about a guest it would be hard like there's mm. there's a lot of people i'm very excited to talk to in the magic community but if i made like a top eight i'm sure michael j as he's called in his podcast would be on it for sure for sure yeah so yeah my first real exposure to the the character the thought um the voice of michael j flores was definitely through listening to the top level podcast so one of my favorite magic podcasts over the years. I mean, it's really been going a long time now. Uh, it's a show that he uh, runs along with, you know, Patrick Chapin, who's just basically another one of like the top magic players of all time, one of the original thinkers in magic. And uh, so the two of them, just like their, their friendship, their knowledge of magic, their experience with just all of the pros in the game over literally decades uh, is just incredible. And so, you know, listening to them riff on everything magic related and otherwise is just one of my favorite things uh, from top level podcasts. So for me to be able to jump from that to actually bridging onto our own podcast is a real honor for sure. One of the nicest things you've ever said to me is when you invited me to become the co-host of this show, you literally said, I may have found the Patrick Chapin to my Michael J. <laughs> which is it is a reference of course to our guest and their podcast and like like that hit with me cuz i love that podcast too and and i that's how i knew like oh that that, that like hit with me it's... so good i'll never forget that you said that <laughs> And oh, I, I love it i mean i really i feel that way i feel like um you know i play the role of you know kind of like um you know, trying to, trying to keep things straight, maybe trying to play the good cop a little bit, you know, and then I feel like you come in with that, that Patrick Chapin energy, that kind of bracing, you know, that kind of contrarian, that kind of cheeky trickster energy, that Valky energy. Right. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, that like, that's so, that's so exciting to be able to kind of share the stage of we, we've already recorded it and we're going to dive into it soon, but I felt like I learned that I still have a lot to learn about podcasting and to keep trying to make this show better because he's, he, he, he's so good at what he does, Michael Flores. He really is. And it was like being next to him, I think we were both kind of like, holy cow, this guy, he just sees the game at that next level. But better than that, like I think you and I have been there a few times where we see the next level of the game. He articulates it so yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, my, master. Yeah. Total I, master. I've been reading his work and he's a writer. And right now he is uh, writing for coolstuffinc.com. So we have a sponsor in common, uh, he and I, which is pretty awesome. So you can check him out, Michael Flores on coolstuffinc.com. And I've been reading his stuff for I don't know how long. I think I started reading magic articles in like the, it, it was in the 90s. I'm not kidding. When I was finding stuff on the internet that wasn't fully formed, but he wrote the article uh, about who's the beat down asking that critical question. And it's, it's given me so much of a different way to approach the game and just his writing style in general. I don't know how to explain it, but it goes, it feels tangenty, but he brings it all the, together. And then you understand what you're doing better than you thought you did. And his latest article on coolstuffing.com is about Golgari Snow, and he kind of circles it back to what I was doing with Blood on the Snow and the Blood Money style decks in Standard 2022, and he brings it full circle to why this is like the best version of the Snow deck that you can be playing, comparing a lot of what I used to do and a lot of what's going on in the format. And I read it, and it, it does mention me a few times, including what I did in my videos. I read it, and I'm like, oh yeah, now I understand why I like that deck. Like, like I had he none like, of this figured out. He explained your own theory to you. <laughs> he, and he did it better than I could. It was, oh my gosh. That's amazing. Blew my mind. So, yeah. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, it's true. So much of what we do in magic yeah, happens on kind of a subconscious level. We do it because it feels good. We do it because, you know, it fills in the curve. We do it for various reasons. But yeah, having having a real master be able to just kind of dissect it, lay it out for you. I mean, that's that's what makes people like Michael J. Uh, such important contributors to the game. So uh, without further ado, why don't we get it rolling? Michael J. Flores. Okay, and here we go as the Arena Craft Podcast. I am here with Arjuna. Say hi, Arjuna. What's up, everybody? And Michael J. Hello. Welcome to the show. Hello to you, CGB. Thanks for having me. An absolute pleasure. And we're going to dive right into the SCG Tour online satellite results because the story right now, uh, when these results came in, kind of the first competitive tournament, is that there's already something that needs to get banned because is it Epiphany at 16% of the field won 75% of its matches and looking at the top eight had six of the eight spots. And that's a Oof. lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Ooh, it was six of the eight spots. Surely it must have won the tournament. Ooh, it's not though the only 6 0 in the tournament. The 6 0 belongs to Mono Green Aggro. Well, what if we looked at, say, the next two tournaments? Surely, is it Epiphany would have won one of the next two? Uh, um, or actually, the the next one also has two six O's. They're both mono green aggro. Oh wow! <laughs> right. Yeah, I could and we'll, total, we'll... totally see how this would be a problem. <laughs> then the, so what? What, what about tournament. the third one? Yeah, there's a third one. Um, uh, num- there's three six O's. Yeah, there's. Two mono green aggros, and there's a mono white aggro. Yeah, Easy, bro. I could totally see why uh, a chicken would be looking at the sky and, uh, and screaming to ban Alrin's Epiphany uh, based based on these definitive results. Uh, that <laughs> clearly the 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 combo time walk deck is the most successful and powerful deck in the format. Sounds it, like it. Yeah, it's it definitely stands out, especially when we talk about like that match win percentage. Sounds terrifying at first. If you, if Arjuna, what if you had to guess off the top of your head, what would did that match win percentage? It was seventy five percent in tournament number one. What do you think it went to in tournament number two? Okay, in tournament number two, I'm giving it. Let's give it somewhere in the sixties. Let's say a sixty five percent. Okay, Michael J. Do you want to place a bet? Uh, I don't really understand how any of these mathematics work, so I'll just I'll just uh, wait and then make a, a witty comment. And oh, I like it! I like <laughs> it. Then, um, sorry, Arjuna, the number is fifty-five percent. Ooh, it's twenty whole percentage points down. Yikes! Yeah. yeah, one tournament later, which is quite the drop, you might say. And then uh, the last tournament, uh, number three, that we're going to be covering. 50 percent down wow. to 50 50 just like that i mean first of all thank god right like <laughs> it would be an actual bad thing if you had a deck that sustained a 75 percent win percentage over the over the course of time but i actually think it, you know sometimes things just get momentum and they they ban things because they might like you know when they banned book of exalted deeds in in standard 2022 like it why did it did it have an abnormally high win percentage not really was it like super popular not really why did you ban it then Eh, some people didn't like it right like so yeah. if you're in a situation where you're like oh man some people don't like this card that's been in print for you know however many however many months like we should ban it then uh, i don't like that and i just don't like it structurally despite the fact that i mostly play you know some version of your black snow decks and and Alrin's epiphany is very good against those decks i wouldn't like the idea of banning Alrin's epiphany because then you would actually have a problem in standard right that that would make a problem so that so that's compelling i'd love to hear you unpack that a little bit michael J. like what what are the forces that you see that are kind of being held in check at the moment so like Alrin's epiphany is 
kind of the most powerful thing, right? It's, it, it, you know, sometimes just like you made two birds and cantrip the land and you're not in a position to attack, right? And you're like, so sometimes, you know, you rail four Aaron's Epiphany consecutively, you know, in, in two turns and your opponent's dead from, from 20. I did right? that but, today. Yeah, so that happens sometimes, right? So, but it, some, you know, the stars have to kind of align, your opponent has to kind of tap out. Literally, I was just doing the math. I was playing against a blue white deck, actually, at this point. So I, you know, got him to tap out. I played a Lolf, made two two ones, and I'm like, all right, he has a he has a tucked card. I'm assuming this is an Alarn's Epiphany. Uh, and you know, he doesn't I'm win I'm winning, right? Like I'm ahead on life, I have more cards. It's like the question I have is like, is a random card and let's assume that he attacks my Lolf and I trade my two two ones for his two one ones, right? Is a random card off the top of his deck better or worse than a Lolf with one and then three loyalty counters? I actually think that the Lolf is better. Just like, what would you rather have? You can draw one card. You don't know what the card is. Or you have a three three loyalty Lolf and it's in play. Which one would you rather have? It's really yeah. hard. It's And um, that is, a that is Alan Epiphany's good matchup, right? Like, so just contextualize it like that this is like the matchup they want so loth is maybe the third best card in the in the black deck right so yeah it's like okay a resolved attack on a single alarm's epiphany is probably not as good as what's left over from the loth that you unsuccessfully attacked it's real hard for me to say that that card is too abusively strong. I mean, it feels bad when you do something. You, they cast a hundred dollars in Spiffany's, you can't win. Yeah, but that's good because it puts it puts a, a wall up in the format. Yeah, there's what a ceiling. Really, there's a ceiling. What would really happen is it would reveal what the real most powerful cards in, in the format are, right? Like right now, people can play Alarm's Epiphany and they can go over the top of people who are, you know interacting with the hoi polloi and we're just like ah you know i i have to remove creatures right like i'm i'm a lowly <laughs> board control deck or whatever but on a practical functional level blood on the snow would become an abusive card right like right now you know sometimes you just kill like a a wolf and some two two cats and you get back a one four and a treasure and you know it's not that spectacular and your opponent has this illusion that he can still win the game. And that's good for you, right? Because he will continue to play a deck like that, thinking that he can win the game. But you know the truth, right? Like that one four is that's going to be four cards now. He's never going to do another point of damage to you. And uh, that's cool. And there's the other games where you're just like, all right, you make some giant planeswalker and they're, you know, they lose six creatures. Like usually when you're playing against mono weight and they didn't draw Palo, right? So they don't draw Palo or you drew two blood in the snow and they, you know, they get six for one and you have a lull at the end of it, right? Um, I think that right now the a variety at the top end because there's many different kinds of good blue red decks and there's multiple kinds of blue white decks and there's some blue black decks. Because of the variety at the top end, people don't perceive blood in the snow as being as functionally powerful as it is against the whole bottom yeah, to yeah. you know 63rd percentile of the of the metagame but that would become very apparent very quickly when people can no longer time walk and, and make birds so right now there's this thought like okay storm the festival is like the most powerful thing you can do oh it's not right so <laughs> the number of times people storm and they make a prosperous innkeeper in a non-basic land is they i guess people just forget Right, like, oh, you know, please, like, please oh, yeah. do go on. Go, please do oh, go I mean, on like, about this, Michael this, Like, people are like, I mean, like, uh, so you know, you reached out to me a couple weeks ago. I'd, I'd made Mythic with uh, this black green deck. I'm like, oh, I really like Storm the Festival in black green. I could make a Ren and a Lolf, right? Oh, it's so powerful. And then, you know, I was, I was losing some to Storm the Festival decks, right? So I was just like, all right. I started playing this black green deck because Ren and Seven dominates Goldspan Dragon. Over the course of the next week or so, people just stopped focusing on Goldspan Dragon. Even blue red quote unquote dragon decks are making Ashmouth Dragons. Ashmouth Dragon. That guy is the truth. That I can guy, talk about Ashmouth yeah, Dragon. Egg, he is baby. The uh, truth. That okay? guy does not need to connect to kill you. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean, I, I could talk for half an hour just on, I think Ashmouth Dragon is really, really powerful. And depending on how, how the the format shifts like i would i would be like i will figure out how to sideboard the dragon egg in a black blue deck 
I would just want to sideboard that in against other control decks and never lose, right? Like it's so powerful. It's a two mana investment. It's everything Delver of Secrets ever wanted to be when it grew up. And it's like everything you your entire modern deck wants to be and you don't have to invest anything in it. It's just, all right, I got cast a cantrip, you know? Like, yeah. Siphon well, you, like everything is, you know, pew, pew. It's, it's the red Tomagoyf is what you're it's, saying. It's so, I mean, I, it's so good. It's so unbelievably good, right? So people stopped playing Goldspan Dragon. So you had, you didn't have to dominate Goldspan Dragon anymore because um, people, people stopped playing Goldspan Dragon. So I'm like, all right, people are playing more Storm the Festival decks. And so I, I switched to playing a more mono black deck with Meat Hook Massacres instead of, instead of Renan Seven, instead of all, all these green lands and stuff. And I just play against, lots and lots of storm the festival decks every day and it it just dawned first of all even when they win the lottery like who cares like i oh. usually i'm just like oh, oh no oh no you have a a card that i a, a card that's equivalent to the card i cast two turns ago right like, oh no i'm in so much trouble and so like they they're like, oh i'm gonna put out so many permanents and i'm gonna do all these things and i'm like yeah yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna desperately throw away my hive of the eye tyrant so that you'll throw a lot of resources at it, and you just want them to cast all these storms, and you just cast like one meat hook massacre. <laughs> I was like, Bleh. Just, next, like what do you? You have no cards left, and literally half the time they're like, prosperous and keeper, and uh, you know, forest go. <laughs> that was a, that was a great use of ten mana, buddy. Yeah. Right, you know. Yeah. So uh. that that card is super high variance. It can be really really powerful. If your opponent is not playing cards like Meat Hook Massacre and Blood in the Snow, but if you're playing Meat Hook Massacre and Blood in the Snow, Storm of the Vessel decks are like beyond not scary. Like, I mean, you just, it takes a long time to win, but you just basically never lose. Yeah. Like, I, oh, what, what, what's that Plane of Cleansing card that you've been popularizing, Kovaco Blue? Oh, Dev that card's good. Devastating, Devastating Mastery. Mastery. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah. I got wrecked playing against one of your blue white Devastating Mastery yeah. decks with my festival deck the other day. Yeah, just could not. A, there's no way I could ever grind out against that card. That's a paradigm shifting card, I think, because previously the the kind of black control decks could attack on multiple different, you know, they're all on the battlefield, but you got to pick if you're going to, you know, Doom Scar their creatures, you're going to pick if you're going to fight their planeswalkers, you know, something that's treasures and clues sitting you know they're giving you clues they're sitting out there but one devastating mastery it truly is devastating it is uh that that card i i wish i caught it a little sooner like my very first versions of blue white but as soon as i found so many times i was in a battlefield against a renin seven and a chariot and all these creatures on the board it was like you you got to clean the whole battlefield and devastating mastery has been lurking and the man is awkward because you need four white sources but those new yeah. dual lands really make it easy you know because now you can like they enter the battlefield untapped they're, they're just so clean i love it so i think like what would happen is you would shift to you know if they're like all right let's ban Aaron's epiphany it's it's too abusively strong right like if you did that blood in the snow would go like this and then i think people would just realize that they can play blue white or even blue black decks without Aaron's epiphany that are very good and devastating mastery based blue white decks. If those became popular, they would just utterly dominate the, the black control decks, right? You can just make them. So they always win. Right. Yeah. And then because the black control that can't put enough pressure on you, right? Like they can't, you have to kind of agree to let their cards matter if you're the blue white deck. And sometimes you do. Um, the, but if you're just like, all right, I'm going to ignore everything that you do. And I, you know, just draw enough faithful mendings, then you're, probably not going to die to their one, one and one, four attackers <laughs> until yeah, you, yeah. you know, you know, flashed back a, a bunch of card draw. And, um, you know, there's, uh, I think the blue black control deck is also, I mean, is really potentially very impressive. Um, and you know, those cards, those decks rather don't, don't rely on Alvin's epiphany. I actually think Alvin's epiphany, it's presence in the format is going to allow right now, if you leave it there, allow great deck design innovations, right? So CGB, you shared with me, uh, I think a screenshot of uh, a black control deck siding test of talents in. I'm like, well, why wouldn't we just play some tests? If you're going to say play, play best of one, why don't you start with the mono black control deck, shave a land, cut out the Tibalt, right? So you took out the most expensive card, take out the Tibalt, add two tests of talents, 
swap out the mountain I play. I don't know. You know, I don't know if you play a mountain. I swap in the mountain I play for an island, and let's go. Right? Like yep. you know, I, I think two Tessa talents is more than enough to stop all the Alrin's epiphanies that they tap out for. Right? If somebody's gonna like, all right, tucking an Alrin's epiphany, I'm gonna take an eight mana turn. They don't have any mana left over to combat you when you test of talents them, and then their their twin cast thing now fizzles. Right? So. Uh, you know, yeah. I think that it's cool. It creates these pockets of innovation. And obviously the black deck then gets worse against green. It gets worse against white by playing cards like Test of Talents, which essentially have no text, right? Like, yeah. what would you ever test of Talents in the white deck? Nothing. Like There's plus nothing. Plus one, plus one card. You yeah. know, it's just nothing, you know? Um, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, you could, I guess you could, you could test a brawl. You could test, a, you know, some other fight spell, you know, pump spell, but. It's not exciting. No, I, I love the idea though that against like those control decks, you might have a field of ruin sitting on the battlefield, right? And like four, like three swamps, you know, and they go for their big combo, right? Oh, you sacrifice your field yeah. of ruin and you go fetch an island and go Get test em. of talents, <laughs> baby. Oh my god, Get I, I love it so much. I, I'm just scared to play 23 lands. You know, yeah. maybe it's silly, right? So I have you know 23 lands, four eye twitch, four. Um, for specimens, you know, that's kind of a lot of land, right? Uh, it, it can but... be. Yeah, the environmental sciences just ties that room together because you don't need the turn three to be super mana efficient. There's nothing you really want to play. Well, it'd be yeah, but now if I'm going to play an island, am I going to go, oh, I better have some archaics in my sideboard. <laughs> How fancy am I going to become oh, as a result of this it. one island? That, that's juicy greed. I like it. I, like I, it. We, I mean, there's maniacs who have green artifact removal in their sideboard you know that are just they're just playing it off of playing it off of treasures just I, treasure yeah exactly. i keep trying that and i never i, I i've never done it. it it seems like i don't think i've ever containment breached something from mono black but i think that it would be a different animal <laughs> with a card like test of talents because it can just win the game on the spot it feels like oh it's it's so exciting i i, I don't know i think there's a school of thought that says that if you get excited by the thought of like playing a deck a certain way or something that you've, you've already lost, right? Like you can't be Ooh, excited. You, you, okay. you have to, the cool things are dangerous. Um, and that, you know, you have to, you have to be even Steven, but I'm, I'm still excited. I, I can't wait to try main deck test of talents. So I'll, I'll be sad to say goodbye to Tibble unless you can tell me somebody else to cut. Well, <laughs> I, so, I so I'm, I'm curious about that, Michael J. So when you're when you're main decking this test of talents and then your matchups on the ladder are just mono green, mono green, mono white, mono green, right? Which is what I expect, is what I expect to happen after looking at these SCG tour results. Like, is 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 that ultimately where you're gonna want to end up being? Yeah, but I mean, you're not losing to those. I mean, right now, right, you have a seven drop in your deck and another we're talking about having a seven drop in your deck and another land, right? So yeah, yeah. be some percentage of the time that you will mulligan more by having one fewer land in your deck, right? But seven drop is like hyper medium against those decks, right? Like if you live long enough to cast it, anything that costs five, six or seven mana is going to win the game for you. So it's kind of arbitrary. Uh, but like, I think you just like draw specimens late and then just, you know, loot the test of talents away and hope whatever the top card of your library is, is better if that's, if that's what's appropriate. I, I just, it's not bad. It's not, it's not great. But right now, I think you're, if you're a black control deck, you're generally, I don't even, I don't, I don't know what everybody's win percentage is, you know, but like, I don't feel great playing against, uh, you know, a first turn Hall of Storm Giants, right? Like, no matter what comes after the Hall of Storm Giants, like, I, I know that I have to, like, you know, mute Grace and Frankie, put down my coffee, and then look at the screen real intently in a way that I don't have to if, uh, my opponent's just like first turn uh, snow covered forest go. Right? <laughs> yeah. First turn yeah. snow covered forest go is just like, oh man, I'm that much closer to today's daily gold quest, you know? <laughs> it's, it's just yeah, it's like a you know a factual statement almost. So uh, you know, you have to you have to pay attention. Um I I certainly win some of the time, not not nearly as much. And so I think like you know, snow covered plains, you'll win maybe a little bit less, but you you usually win. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so, so you you've got room, is what she's saying. You've got a little room to play with that. And I just, I just don't think it's that bad, right? Like at some point, you're, you know, what are you even getting with your, 
with your lesson learns, right? Like I usually just get my, um, my environmental sciences yep. and, you know, just scry once or something. And I, I, I went down to one mascot exhibition. I was just never winning with it. Right. Like the second mascot exhibition, yeah. I would discard to hand size in like yeah. the late game I've, so often. I've actually been cutting that card from like all, but my most creatureless of decks. Right. Cause sometimes you do need a win con or something, yeah. but apart from that, I've actually just yeah. been running none of them. Really? I, I think you need to keep them honest though. Right. Because if, if, if you guys true. are playing best of one, I'm, you know, I used to be, all best of three but i think in part because of cgb's videos i i became much more of a best of one person in the last couple of months and uh you know if you're playing a lot of best of one you have a you're certainly over indexing for lesson learned sideboards right like mm -hmm. people don't play lesson learned sideboards in best of three at nearly the same rate you have to assume they have at least one mascot exhibition even if they're playing like you know green white magecraft yeah they've got a mascot exhibition yeah. in their yep. sideboard. yeah so you need to keep them honest, right? So you know mm -hmm. you don't want to be a situation where like, okay, I played a great attrition game for ten turns and I'm like you know five percent ahead of you, and then they're like, all right, seven drop, a hundred power, go, and you're like, oh, I better draw one of my bombs here, right? Like, you know, and you're staring at a, I don't know, annihilation or something. Right? I, you, you, yeah, I like this because when. Like Huey Jensen made a video with uh, blood on the black, white blood on the snow during 2022 standard. And the only change he made from uh, the first list that I posted was he went up to four mascot exhibitions and also, four? Wow. yeah, four. Wow. And also when Brad Nelson <laughs> played it on his stream, he, he went up on mascot exhibition because he's like, oh, I just see how this plays out because it was kind of. Aside from like all runs epiphany gold span dragon, it was like the format ceiling for all the other control mid range decks was like just like spamming mascot exhibition but that's that's weird to me i mm -hmm. that but I that mean, was 2022 well yeah mm -hmm. I, I by the end of 2022 i had gone to your i think it's almost man it's probably like 59 out of 60 or whatever the same as your rakdos list like i think i played more loth or something yeah um, but uh, that was clearly the best blood on the snow deck against blood on the snow decks because yes. you're just like i mean Nobody can beat an Emerson Predator fair and square in 2022. Like now, Emerson Predator is a joke. You tap one mana and you kill it. Like, but, yeah. um, but back then, you're like, it came in under blood on the snow, <laughs> and it lived through blood on the snow. Like, it was it was such a, and it, it also it, you know, it ate their Lolf, it ate their Liliana, whatever they've got. Um, wait, have I been using this term wrong? I use the term blood money to describe any black snow based deck that has a treasure engine. But it seemed to me from watching some subsequent videos of yours that you were specifically talking about black white decks as blood money decks. Talk to me about that, CGB. I don't like to I, use the wrong term. I rarely name my decks. Like it's something I don't do that. I often. always name my decks. Yeah, yeah. So so this was <laughs> this was fresh for me. And I thought Blood Money was an awesome name because it had Kaya. Uh, who's an assassin and it had the Skullport merchant who, you know, and has the treasure for the yeah, money. So. so I was just like, it's a sweet name. And in my head, it's a sweet it, name. Thank you. It, it's descriptive. It, also, yeah. my names are like a lightsaber. I'm like, well, yeah. Why like, is that it, a lightsaber? Well, it, you know, we, yeah. we had a previous version that was Excalibur. This is a, <laughs> this is a, a different sword type. <laughs> I, I could listen to a podcast about you describing the names of the decks that you guys did over the years. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, there's an, there's an episode of uh, UMTG Taps, you know, uh, Big Head Joe and, and Joey Pasco's podcast that Patrick Chapin and I recorded in, at U.S. Nationals 2010. Uh, and the whole second half, and they were like, hey, let, you know, these guys are just, you know, we, we had never met them in real life, I think, right? And they're like, oh, we're all going to U.S. Nationals. Let's all be buddies, right? So let's record a podcast together. And Patrick and I, I think, talked for an hour about the meaning of different lightsaber colors and their implications on the character of a person <laughs> who would be right. you. and then like a long thing about uh my thoughts on recycling and, and, pa and patrick's conclusion at the end was that he would he would vote for me for president based on my thoughts on recycling nice so you know if you can look that one up it's I, I, i'm gonna dig i might dig for that one uh yeah. i was gonna say the blood also applies to the blood on the snow um but yeah, back like cycling back to the name thing. In my head, it's always the black white deck. 
but I've heard it used by everybody else to describe what you're saying, like any blood on the snow uh, treasure strategy, because that is like, that's all it takes. It doesn't need Kaya. Like yeah, the, so, the treasure and the blood equals blood money. So that's what I thought based on context clues. But then, then like when I just watched you play against black white decks and then you had become insistent on the use of blood money almost in, in, in those cases. And I was just like, have I been using this wrong the whole way? Yeah. It's like, when I was in high school, I kept using the word besmirch when I meant the word begrudge. And like, I went through all through <laughs> high school using the word besmirch. And I mean, and I, it, it makes me cringe now. I haven't been in high school for like 30 years. Okay. So. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to save, you know, in my head, it was, it was the black, white deck for a long time, but the term now belongs to the community. So we'll just talk about all the blood on the snow and treasure decks can be blood money decks. I think, I think that's fair. <laughs> You, you just open sourced it, Michael J. Love it. I mean, it, that's very magnanimous of, uh, of CGB. Do you want to talk about Sandy Dog MTG's mono green list? Because I think it's, among other things, you know, Sandy Dog MTG with a, is that a forest in play? I mean, like, <laughs> did he read it wrong? That, do, you know, that doesn't tap me. <laughs> this is not going to make a very big wild in the cattle. I hate to tell you, right? Yep. Like, you know? yep. <laughs> Sandy Dog is known as, uh, very aggressive and usually red, a uh, very, very red mage who's dabbled in Gruel and dabbled in Boros, but for the most part, will play mono red wherever he can. And uh, going mono green here, going four Ren and seven mono green here, which, oh my gosh, I didn't know he, he played value Planeswalkers in the main deck. So they listed well, this as mono green aggro. This is like way more mid-range even than i think than the mid-range mono green deck that you had posted a couple of weeks ago this is not that aggro to me what do you think yeah, i mean i i mean it, yeah he's certainly looking to like get his party started like turn four five six right so i totally agree i mean those are usually the turns in a lot of these stompy decks where you're looking to kind of overwhelm your opponent and close out the game you know even if you're not actually winning on turn four you're looking to effectively win on turn four so yeah i mean he's definitely just slowing the game down and trying to win on on the later turns and actually build like a really kind of chonky thick board presence right so yeah what is I, chonky that's like the <laughs> pioneer red deck with four drops <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that's a lot of cards that are two mana more expensive is that, is that, that, that kind format? of Todd Anderson, right? Wasn't that kind of a deck that he really got into and pioneer for a while there? So yeah, exactly. It's a little bit more of the philosophy of what I see going on here. I think so, it's interesting that in this format, uh, with the All Runs Epiphany going way over the top, that this kind of four Ren and Seven main deck less beat down where where other people were running unnatural growth. Like I've been seeing that in mono green list on ladder and in some of these results, the double the power and toughness of all yeah. your creatures oh God, that as God. the five drop. Oh, we got opinions on that card. It, it, here's a funny thing. You actually have to have creatures in play for the for the <laughs> thing to double its power and toughness. It, yeah. The trigger still goes. Even there's nobody in play. <laughs> it's, it's it's wonderful uh, when you do that. <laughs> You know, yeah. yeah, great, great in aggro matchups. Terrible against Blood on the Snow. I'm sure Michael J has been licking his lips every time he sees that card come down. But it's like, I mean, is it great in aggro matchups? I feel like a lot. It, it depends on how the games progress, right? Yeah. Like, it, there's a whole philosophy which is like, if you go second, just trade off as much as you can, and then you'll be one card ahead, right? So I, I don't know yeah. if you want to. I don't know if you want to even draw that card if if somebody's trying to trade off on you. I, I think that Sage Dog MTG's deck is. Is really surprising to me. Like old growth troll seems like one of the most problematic cards in that deck. If I lose to the mono green deck playing any of the black decks, it's because of old growth troll. Yeah. That guy's highly resilient against uh against mass removal, and he tramples over the two spiders that you put in front of him to kill your lolf, right? Like it's odd to me to cut that and then add. In my opinion, and maybe my opinion is horribly wrong because San Diego MCG is, of course, a Grand Prix champion. Uh, you know, replacing it with one Briarbridge tracker, which has less toughness and and way less trample uh, for the same amount of mana. But it has two less green pips in the casting cost. I think this is Sandy saying, "I want four Faceless Haven in my deck, and <laughs> and I'm not going to compromise on that." And I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm with you. I love the troll. But he has 20 sources of primary green, right? In addition to 16 Soak Over Force, he has four Kazandu Mammoth. 
Yeah. Yep. He's that's got true. a lot of green mana. Right. Like I, I don't. I mean, I don't think pips is an issue. Like, I mean, doesn't well, everybody play play for faceless haven? The thing that more surprising is there's no field rune in this main deck. There's no field right. rune anywhere. Yeah. None. Which is, it is an interesting choice because so he's running the full eight creature lands that he can, right? And I think in part that's because he's running the Renin Seven. You know, if you're going to hit a land yeah. off the of Renin Seven, it might as well be a, a late game creature land that can actually potentially win you the game. But I do agree that it's, it's so he's kind of positioning himself as more of the aggressor, right, than the defender. I mean, obviously, if you're running Field of Ruin, that's because you're actually worried about getting swung on by your opponent's uh, land. So maybe he just thinks, well, I'm going to have the ball locked up and I'm just going to try to be the aggressor here. Yeah. I, I actually thought Field of Ruin was important to play just as a check against the entire metagame. Like, because this deck can't really, it doesn't express an opinion on somebody going off against you with Book of Exalted Deeds, right? I think like sure. you have to kind of acknowledge that that exists at some level or you'll always lose to it, right? Like that's the... That's a problem, especially if you're not playing the fastest version of this aggregate. Like he's playing like the third fastest version. And they just, you know, gain four life a couple of times and they go off and you've, you've literally no recourse. Um, I, I don't know. I know it's not popular, but like it's a reason it shouldn't it be kind of popular. It's, it is a powerful strategy. People There's, don't have emergent ultimatums anymore. There's a tiny, tiny bit of recourse. There's an Outland Liberator. We got we got a one of in the main deck for survival mechanism. And then there's three Tangle Traps in the sideboard, which I always forget because I think of it as a gold span dragon killer, but it has that instant speed destroy target artifact. But you can't stop them if they if they just destroy all your creatures a couple of times and then do it all in one turn, right? Yeah. It's true. If they're if they are running the if their board wipe game plan is going according to plan, you're you're probably in trouble. I I I can't imagine. I I think that that deck, the Book of Exalted Deeds, needs to kind of pick up in meta share because I I agree. I don't think Sandy's really respecting it for this tournament. So just imagine for a second. Or first of all, the deck that I'm going to describe is probably not very good against black blue for example right but like what if you were just like all right i'm a mono white deck but my mono white includes blue white cards like uh faith of uh, uh, faithful what's it called faithful mending, faithful right? mending. yeah yeah all right so i'm gonna be able to dig through my deck better because i have cards like this but even more than that if i'm in an un unconvenient matchup i can get rid of the things that i don't want with a faithful mending um i mean this is like also a convenient way to just trigger book of exalted deeds Right, so I think that deck could be made with like a bunch of devastating masteries and it would be, you could, I don't know, because I'm not describing a, a deck in detail, I'm describing some concepts around the deck. I think you could make it so that it would raffle stomp black control and never lose to mono green or mono white, right? Like, oh, I like this. Like never. I like where this is going. Right, so, so basically you're like, okay, um, what are the decks that are left? Black, blue, other blue, white. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, black, blue, other blue, white, and and uh, and blue, red decks. Mm -hmm. How many tests of talents do you have to have in your deck so you never lose to blue, red? Because your deck is already full of wraths. There's only two ways that blue, red decks win. They win by time walking you 100 times, or they win with a dragon in play, or like a giant, right? But like a giant is just a bad dragon, right? Like it's not... <laughs> Yeah, it's true. not complicated to flip your doom scar over, right? Like, yep. So, like, you could actually make a deck. You're just like, okay, if you just look at this on the fundamentals, they should be way ahead because they have all these control elements and I have all these creature kill elements. But if you just acknowledge the fact that they only ever win with creatures and they actually literally need to attack you more than one time with their four four flying creature in order to win the game, like you have a window to blow that thing up. You know how many test of talents you need to have in your deck now? to make that matchup very, very solid. So I think like you're now constricting the number of available decks that you can lose to, to black, blue, and and other blue, white decks. And your Book of Exalted Deeds package can just get them yeah. if you're patient because those decks take a long time to win. Like what if I sit there for a long time and I never try to actually kill you until after I've used all of my, uh, all of my Field of Ruins on all of your Field of Ruins? Like that's the game I'm going to play. Now I'm going to try to win. Yeah. Right, like, what do you got? Like two Imrith to win the game? Like, it's this isn't a fast opponent, right? Like, I don't know. I it seems no, to me I, like I, that would be a thing that people could try to do, and it would be great against green and white metagame. 
I do think that like control is better now than it's been in so long. I, I think it's such a much better option in this standard than it was for about two years. Like real, very few win cons play the ultra long game of just sizing up your threats with my answers and I will eventually win uh, control. Arjuna, what do you think? I mean, so cards like Memory Deluge, right? I think uh, that's that's like a return to the kind of cards that would have made an old school mage, control mage salivate, right? I mean, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Michael J, when you read that card, your eyebrows probably raised a fair amount, right? Because it's just, it's the kind of card that can actually give a control deck like the power and the grind that I think that it was missing for a while there, you know, and especially, you know, now that we've lost cards like shark typhoon and whatever, we need incentives, right? We need those cards that really make us think, okay, you know, I really have a Trump or I really have something that can put me over the top. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think control is definitely looking better than it has for a while. I also think just that the threats, like if the best threat that you can put on the board these days is what, just like some, some cheap, kind of go wide white creatures or maybe this you know werewolf pack leader three three for two mana you know these aren't the kind of cards that control can't beat right whereas i think like in in the previous meta games you know it was like let's have fun trying to beat rogues right let's have fun trying to beat like you know or, or like you know these mono red decks that just somehow would so consistently able to like keep pounding your face and keep giving you problems right so i just i don't feel like we have the same level of kind of threats, you know, cheap, nasty, horrible things that can go wrong by turn four, things that can always go bump in the night, right? Like like we did in the previous format. So or do yeah, you know, I don't know. I think control's looking looking great. How many times a day do you play against like a like a goblin javelin ear or like a, <laughs> bat, a battle cry? Like how, how many it's, it's been a while. It's been a really? while. Like, I, I think I play against that <laughs> at least once a day. And I'm I, I'm really happy for that other person. I'm like, <laughs> that person is living the life that they want to live. Like, oh my gosh. They're going to be really, really annoyed by the number of pests that I summon in the first five turns of the game. <laughs> but uh, they're living well, their best life. Like, well, and and I, I wonder how you awesome. specifically feel about this, Michael J, because you, I know that you've been a preeminent red mage and a, and a mono red mage uh, in, for many, many months has passed right all right so i i wrote an article <laughs> once about red and then people were like oh wow you're just like this red guy i'd never played red and standard you know and until like really 2018 I, or something yeah i never I, played red and standard maybe maybe i'm like thinking back uh, longer in top level than i thought i so had but i i you know I'm a mono, I mean, when I say mono red, I mean also Boros, you know, Naya or whatever. Mono sure, red sure. player in modern. And I was playing a lot of modern for like, it was my favorite paper format to play in. And I, you know, travel and, you know, go to SCG tournaments or whatever to play modern. Um, and I thought a lot, I mean, I just really thought a lot about it, right? So I, I, it was important to me to have like a mastery of understanding how to play red decks in modern. And I really enjoyed it. And I'm probably very vocal about it, but prior to, and I, I went on a run, I won a bunch of tournaments with it also. So I think like that was sort of a snowballing thing. So I was like, I won the first mm. one. And then and once you win the third one and you're just like, oh yeah, 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 red's real good. And I'm really good at red. And like, people like to watch me play it. People like to watch me talk about it. And like, so it's, it, maybe it's, it creates a, a monster that's bigger than it, it really ever was. But I, I want a P like the first PPTQ I won with mono red is like, I don't know, like 2017 or something, 2016, something like that. So I, I, I played it in legacy. My friend Patrick Sullivan, you know, made a mono red deck and um, he was just like, if you're frustrated playing blue decks and you don't draw force so well on the right turn, just play this. And, and I, I cashed with it on the star city tour a bunch of times. I had never, never won an event, but I just liked it. So um, I, I went that, but I had, I had written a lot about red uh, and I, there was a, there was a format, I think an extended format around 2004, 2005, where I really developed a mastery of playing the red mirror, especially. So I was really interested in that, but like, I literally never played it in standard until I think 2017, 2018, which is probably crazy to you. Uh, and then I, you know, I liked experimental friendly. That was a good card. <laughs> that, I just, that was a card. I, 
I just I just remember like repeated episodes of Top Level where like Patrick Chapin's just giving you a hard time for being like some born again, you know, red mage on the arena ladder or something. <laughs> Arjuna, I'll just I'll tell you this, man. Sometimes it's just a character, right? Like we're making content, right? Like sometimes I'm talking to my friend, you know, like you know, a lot of the time I'm talking to my friend, I'm doing a pleasant activity that we both enjoy and is a consistent, you know, tent pole in our lives. But, you know, we are doing it for an audience. So, so we get, we get to like, care behind the curtain a little bit. I here, mean, yeah. we, I think we had an episode once. It was just like you and I play same 75. We both play, uh, you know, uh, um, what's the blue red uh, fetch land? Uh, not steam as a scalding tarn right oh, like sorry, yeah. you know me and patrick are going to play the same 75 we both play a scalding tarn in the first turn against the same opponent they have very different suspicions about what's going to be <laughs> that scalding tarn oh yeah <laughs> so Indeed. you know that that was just that was kind of our shtick you know so i i well, don't just, understand uh, this whole character thing i've never done no that. no well, never not no, you know it's all real a hundred percent of the time <laughs> <laughs> love it love it well and I, so just getting back a little bit to this mono green aggro thing i've been seeing some of these mages on the ladder actually taking a shell like this and then actually just putting a little extra top end on it with that storm the festival right they see a deck with four ren and seven they see a deck with four seekers chariot and then they think well, you know what's better than you know better than chocolate? Let's go double chocolate, right? So what? Double what do you chocolate guys... is good, man. I mean, I, double chocolate. I like it. I'm down. It's not with that. bad, right? I'm like, it's not bad. Ganache so, filled brownies, right? Like so. So why do you guys think that Sandy said, "Nah, nah, I'm cool." You know, I'm cool with having my top end just be Ren and Seven. Like, let's let's stop at that. What do you think? Ren and Seven and Asika's Chariot is already very powerful. Like, how powerful do you have to be? <laughs> it's a good at some point, you're you're at a diminishing returns. Like, you don't need to win by a thousand. Winning by one is enough. Yep. At, and there's that ceiling on the format, right? If if you're gonna rely on casting Storm the Festival, having big hits, and then winning the next turn, you might just get all the turns taken on you. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. I, I also think Storm the Festival, even when it's working for you, makes you increasingly uh, bad against Meat Hook Massacre and Blood on the Snow. Like, you're talking about a card that literally just puts more creatures in play, right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> even, if the, even if the creature is the 1313 Planeswalker token, right? It's just another creature. It doesn't make you, it doesn't make you win at all. Not make you win more. It doesn't make you win at all if your opponent's defense is to be sweeping all the creatures. My, Michael's Jay doesn't know, but there's this behind the scenes tug of war going on because in our like before the set came out, our podcast, we Arjuna and I got into a huge debate about Storm the Festival. And I was very much like I was very much for the card in that I thought it was a very cool card. People were going to love playing it and that in like mirrors of the same decks doing the same things like mid range uh, just stuff that the person with one or two storm the festivals would be on top. And Arjuna was like, that card is garbage. <laughs> so he's I was very much a cynic a lot. He's enjoying very much a so cynic much. So, <laughs> of the card. I think that a card is very good, but I think it's all context, right? Mm -hmm. So here's an example. We were kind of brainstorming. Let's say you're going to play at a big, big event uh, in, in regular magic. So not best of one magic, but you still wanted to play a blood money type deck in a big event. I think what you want to do in a format where people have sideboards, like real sideboards, uh, where they can bring in cards like Go Blank. Like, when was the last time either of you played against a Go Blank? Uh, imagine it's been a play, minute. It's been a minute. Imagine playing against a Go Blank, right? And like around turn five, well, you don't, you haven't built your hand up really big yet, right? You might be super boned by one Go Blank, right? Like it, mm. it depletes your graveyard. Go, I, I think like it's a very natural thing for black decks to sideboard cards like that in against other black decks. And so you get a, a tremendous advantage by just having that card. So what you want to do in designing your sideboard for, for an event like this is like to create a bunch of angles where somebody can't just beat you. Like, so if you're just like, all right, I'm going to do more of the same. I'm going to go like triple down on like powerful planeswalkers or dependency on blood in the snow, or maybe I'll tutor things better or whatever. You just get worse and worse against their random two for one that can kill your graveyard. 
But what you get better at is if you just add a card like Storm the Festival to a Blood in the Snow deck, now you've created this huge amount of variance, but you also have the capability to put Loth and Ren and Seven in play at the same time. That is a powerful thing to do off the top of your deck, right? So I think that you were just like, all right, I'm, re- I'm going to be in a situation where we're changing the paradigm. Instead of the paradigm being both of us go to the end game and it's all of my blood on the snows against all of your blood on the snows. What we're going to do is change the paradigm because there's going to be cards like I Tyrant. There's going to be cards like Go Blank that are going to limit the ability for us to just make it all about who draws the most blood on the snows. What if we shift the paradigm to be who gets the most value out of their treasures and their skull port merchants, right? Just like tiny, tiny exchanges because nobody's doing that much damage, right? So yeah. like with, with time, look, we're going to change that paradigm and that like you can flip this script by casting one, one storm of the festival. Because I think that if you do that, in a blood on the snow mirror, not in a, not in like these like storm of the festival decks. That's very difficult for the opponents to be because they're they are already challenged by the four blood on the snow versus four blood on the snow paradigm, right? Like hmm. they were already in a situation where they need their blood on the snows just to combat your regular planeswalkers to combat your blood on the snows. If you now have this, and then you can now do it again if they don't empty your graveyard in the ensuing turn, like. That's tremendously powerful in that context. It's also, it's like, it's, I, th- I think like the Selesnia deck or the, you know, whatever variants with like Vant or whatever are also very powerful. They just don't happen to be good against decks that have multiple Meat Hook Massacre and Four Blood on the Snow, which is the only decks I own, right? So if I, <laughs> if I hadn't taken a year off of Arena, I probably could <laughs> afford to play other decks, but I used all my wild cards on CGB's 2022 deck. And so this is what I've got. And so I have to pretend like it's the best deck because I don't have any choices, right? Um, and it's, it's a very good deck. I don't know if it's the best, but you know, if all you're ever doing is casting the Oak Massacre's Blood in the Snows, then the guy that's putting a bunch of creatures in play and then spends 10 minutes to put even more creatures in play right, right before you cast your, you know, reanimating Wrath of God. I mean, like, yeah, it's not impressive to you. Michael J, you are the true voice of the people because I get that comment every day about how people like a deck and they need me to fix it or update it and stuff because it's the only deck they have now. <laughs> I, I need to respond to something Arjuna said earlier about Deluge, right? Okay. So I finally cobbled together 5,000 gold. Uh, <laughs> to play a quick draft today. And I opened Tolavar and I'm like, I, I really wanted to force Black Blue, but I took the Tolavar. By the end of the draft, I had two Siphon Insights and a Deluge. They all made it into my Ooh. deck. But I'm like, <laughs> you know, so second pick, there's a, there's a Siphon Insight in the, in, the, in, the, in the pack. And I'm like, all right. I took a toll of our first pick, and there was definitely a red-green werewolf card in this pack that would make my deck if I were going to play red-green werewolves. But I'm like, but before the draft started, I had told myself I wanted to play black-blue. And let's be honest... The whole point of quick draft is to open packs so that I can accrue wild cards so I can get the siphon insight. <laughs> I'm do just it. taking the siphon insight. Rare and I was working with more do siphon it. insights. And you know what? When I win no games in this draft, <laughs> I will be ahead. <laughs> and okay. Also, I need to thank CGB. Up until his like vampire burn video from last week, it had never occurred to me to play in those gold grinding events. I just, all I ever did was play ladder. Like, I don't know why anybody... Now I'm like, why does anybody play ladder? These gold grinding events are insane. Yeah. I 7-0 more than 75% of them. Like, <laughs> they're like really, really efficient for accruing, you know, gold for me to play quick drafts that I can go 0-3 in. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> but they're just, you know, they're three times as efficient than if you're just trying to get those resources on, on the Mythic ladder. And, you know, what's the downside? If I don't make Mythic because I played in all these gold grinding events instead of playing on the ladder. Isn't that really just like one, one of those events wins is the equivalent to the prize Delta. Oh, it's it embarrassing. Is. It and, is. and that's insane. It's like, embarrassing. <laughs> so, you know, I, I did mythic last month in, I didn't play 21 hours. I did in 21 hours. Right. So I wild carded red and seven and 21 hours later I was mythic. Right. So, and I, you know, I played five hours or something. Right. So that was a really, that was a really fast grind. Um, you know, in other months I've had to play multiple days to, to get to mythic. Right. But if you think about the return on getting to mythic and then not winning the PTQ, right. It's, <laughs> it's not a high risk. 
<laughs> high time to reward thing. Uh, and, you know, if you just enjoy playing magic, uh, the prizes are way better in the gold grinding thing. And I need to thank you. This is, this is like the scales came off of my eyes. I, I think I'm going to be a standard event four, monster. four player <laughs> perennially now. <laughs> Because my my rank will will erode, right? Like, yeah, you know, I'm I'm platinum this season, but that means I'm going to be you know gold next season or silver or something, and I'll just, I'll just settle on bronze and be like the richest bronze. Yeah, I bronze guess. and so much richer for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All I your will... listeners should should do the gold grinding events. The the, the ladder is a, is a trap. It's such a trap. <laughs> It's the lad has always been a trap. I mean, can we just, <laughs> can we can just we get real? that one out there? I mean, the matchmaking's weird. Everything about it's weird, right? So yeah, it, you can you can just uh, you can just make mythic on unlimited. You don't play limited, Arjuna. Do you play limited? Oh, he. Does. I I do I do occasionally. It's been a long time. I was like Mister Build My Set playing limited kind of a guy for like so long. But you know what? I think this is what I came to. The reason I was so compelled to do that was that I just didn't want to get Ember Cleaved again, right? I've reached <laughs> this point. Or or I remember during the Omnath Omnath days, I was just like I was like, thank God for limited, my friends. I, thank. I took <laughs> <laughs> I took all those. In. I was so off of it that I didn't even log in to get the four Omnath so that I could get the four. So wild you could cards get the right wild cards. I, yeah. I just didn't log in that day. And I'm just like, if you're just like, look, I know you're not playing right now, but just, just, just get the free wild cards. I'm like, I can't make it. Would require me hitting a whole button, <laughs> spending a you know, 35 seconds in the client to get these Omnaths. And then I'd um, have to look at that smug elemental for five seconds too. Yeah. <laughs> but. You know, it was weird. Like, I didn't even try. Like, last month, I I was two ticks from Mythic and in, in Limited. And mm. if I if I had had another 14 minutes, because I was just like, oh, my God, I can I could do a draft. Now there's 14 minutes. I have to have, a you know, not lose a bunch. But I if you if you make Mythic and Limited, you'll nest really high. Right. So mm. you just nest at 500. It's not like um, I, I, I was just like, this is a hustle because. When I made Mythic, you know, two weeks ago, I, you know, you start ninety-two percent. Is that about where you start? I I won somewhere yeah. between five and seven matches in a row, and my rank didn't move. And I was just like, <laughs> "This is insane!" <laughs> wow. But wow. twice I lost, and my rank went up. So I was <laughs> just like, "You've got the you got the secret no sauce, dude." Logic to this, right? <laughs> like. You know, it's terrible secret sauce, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's not you know, great. Like if you lose again, then you lose three points or something, right? I went to like I went to ninety four to ninety five, losing a match once, and I was just like, this does makes no sense. And I won a bunch in a row, and I was just always ninety four. Like, I, ah. I I can't lie. Like the last week of the season where I just didn't play, I think I started my camp at like rank thirty two and ended at fifty two for the last week. Like that was my decay. And I played standard events. I was so happy. I, yeah, but the standard I, I'm just a happy person. A, I had so much more gold. Return. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you can, it was great. You can just, I think, maybe just like, if, you, if it's important to you, I'm like, I like to do it, right? Like, you just grind a mythic for the bragging rights, right? But like, uh, what do you get for being mythic, right? Like, you, if you're top 1200, then you get to play in an event that has one winner. Right? That, that's the... That is the yeah, the path to glory there, yep. right? I, I don't know, man. I've heard a lot of P PTQs in paper. It is way easier than playing at a twelve hundred person. <laughs> For content creators, the um, basically the status indicator that having a mythic badge gives you it it plays, it matters. Yeah, and that's that's something I learned a lot uh, in making content with and without. It's been really awesome now that I've come back to trying events that people are supportive of it because when I figured out that because I was playing events like two years ago on my channel and telling people ladder is ridiculous. Why do it? Like the rewards are this versus this. But as soon as I started playing ladder and started playing in mythic every day, like views went up and I got a lot less of the, why don't you play in? Why are you playing unranked? Why are you playing these good decks and unranked kind of snark comments? But I think to be not just fair, but supportive of your comment, I think one of the reasons why, you know, you stood out to me so much as an impressive content creator was like, you were just doing 
kind of the good version of what I had been trying to do for a lot, a lot of years. Like you just, you're just playing brews every day. Like yeah. here's some like Ellie wick nonsense. I literally spent wild cards on some Ellie wicks because you, you had them first. Right. So I'm like, I'll, I'll Ellie wick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> CGP is like an, you know, mid 500 mythic with this. I'm sorry. So, I'm, yeah, whatever, I, man. You're welcome. I'm not sure which. <laughs> so I, you know, it, the thing was, was like, he must be really good. Because he just and he plays these creative decks and he goes out of his way to play different decks every day, but he can sustain a mythic rank, right? And I mean, as somebody who for you know most of the existence of arena is held down like full time job in addition to doing creative projects and my own projects, and I have a family and all this stuff. I the for somebody who's in that position who has a more limited amount of time to play uh arena versus versus other endeavors just getting to mythic is very challenging for most of us for most of the time right like in like i said in this one case i did it super fast right but i think most of the time you're talking about you know like grinding through diamond is arduous for most people right it yeah the i literally lost twice as many matches at diamond tick one one than i lost in all the rest of diamond Dude, what what is up with that, man? I don't I don't know if I have ever won my winning in for Mythic the first time ever. Like I what, lost, man. Dude, they, I lost, there's something there. There's something I lost there. three times, got back, lost twice. Well, the first time I lost three times, that was as many matches I had lost all through Diamond. So I was just like, oh no. Is it going to be one of those times? Am I, I going to fall to Diamond 2? Oh. <laughs> so like an hour later, I'm at Diamond 1, and I lost twice. I'm like, oh, I thought I was going to make it. Oh, yeah. is, and I only lost one more time. But I lost six times at 1-1, and I only lost three times you know, in all of Diamond 4, Diamond 3, etc. All right. Ha- okay, I'll throw it to both of you. Uh, start with Arjuna. Have you ever taken the Great Fall? Diamond, one win from Mythic all the way to Diamond 4. Have you ever done it? Ooh, you know, I think Diamond Three. I've gotten down to Diamond Three. Yep, that was. Uh, I don't think I've ever hit the rock bottom. No, Michael. No. If I ever get that close, I just make it. Okay. Okay. That's <laughs> but gonna my, make... a, a lot of months. I'm just like I'm just in platinum, and I'm sick of playing against Winota. Yeah. Right. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was really compelling to me when when you were doing the standard 2022 content, because it, for, I, I, I'm just stupid, I guess. Like, I don't know about gold grinding events, you know, for a long time, I just opened packs. People were like, why don't you play in drafts? I'm like, what is this? What are you talking about playing in drafts? It, was, it was basically costs the same. And, and I'm like, then I get additional packs. I'm like, Those are the packs that you open to play in the draft. I'm like, Oh, interesting. <laughs> like I was just taking all my gold and opening packs and never getting a gem. I got it. Yeah. I don't know if there's somebody wrote a guide somewhere about how to play arena, but you know, I, I'd never played any gold grinding events until last week, but um, you know, uh, this, you know, it never occurred to me to play standard 2022. I'm like, what's this weird, not real format. I'm not going to play it. So I was just like banging my head against the wall playing against Winota every day. And it's just not like Winota's unbeatable. It's just like, I'm never happy. Yeah. Like if I, if I beat yeah. Winota, it's because they missed and because they have stupid mm. one three dwarf in their deck, which is like they have all these unplayable cards in their deck. Like I have one three dwarf, get there, you know, like, yeah. and then like, then they miss and you're like, yeah, I, I won against Winota. Go figure. And then when you lose, it's just because they won the lottery and there was no skill in either game, right? Like I mm. lost no skill, won no skill. So it was just super unsatisfying. But like, the 2022 format was so varied and like i love the formats where it's just like i'm just gonna change one card and i'm like angling this mirror a certain way and i've, I've got emerson predator and apparently i had ellie wick i own i own four now thanks a lot man uh <laughs> but it was it was way better i wanted to make that blue green deck that arjuna likes right yeah but i had used too many I, I the first day i i when i came back they put it on the phone throne was the quick draft format and i just never lost right so mm-hmm. i had accumulated all these all these resources from from throne quick drafts and i blew all the wild cards i had trying to make a white weenie deck for standard 2022 and somehow just used them on all the wrong rares so like i i somehow own like one uh aspirant and like two sky clay apparitions Ooh. but i have like Brutal. four warhounds <laughs> Four of the what's the 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 
the three mana enchantment that like uh sparring regimen oh yeah I, i'm like oh yeah this is definitely oh. going to my deck right so, <laughs> so i just wasn't thinking i was just like oh, i'm just gonna these rares seem like they you know they just don't see play because of winota and emergent ultimatum they're gonna be good in this format and i didn't look at any lists so i'm just like <laughs> and then i you know i start playing and i'm like oh yeah, I really should have gotten Aspirants because I'm playing the Mirror Match and they're making plus one, plus one counters and I'm just losing because my guys are all small still. <laughs> yeah. Tr tr truly a man of the people, Michael J. You you will undoubtedly be one of the most popular guests we've ever had on this show. Have you so. had a lot of guests? <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> we, actually, we've, we've had plenty. We've had plenty. It's been a while, though. It's been a while. Arjuna started the podcast and every week was a different guest for... Uh, months right like six months like quite a while yeah yeah before, before i joined the team yeah before the the magic the magic duo <laughs> settled in indeed yeah. but uh yeah it's uh it's 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 a pleasure to have you here and uh you are you are speaking you're speaking directly to the hearts and minds of, of our audience and they're gonna love this do you want to talk about world's predictions? Wasn't that the other thing we were supposed to talk I, about? I I do. I I was wondering if I was going to find a nice smooth segue for that, but that that was perfect. We'll go with that. <laughs> I I'm I'm curious, you know, given how the meta's shaping up and this new standard format and worlds coming up on October eighth, I want to know what we thought would show up. Um, so I was going to go around the table. Uh, Arjuna, do you want to go first? What do you What are you predicting for worlds given what's going on? Oh, that's really interesting. So, okay. Um, side note, I was just eyeballing one of these mono white lists um, that I saw at the SCG and I don't want to go deep on it, but I just, I think that there's this kind of interesting thing happening right now where I think people are trying to decide like, what does mono white have on mono green, right? Like, because that, that's one of the big things in my mind that I would be asking is, do I expect mono white to show up at all at Worlds? Um, and if, and if it did, why would it show up? Right. So, um, one of the things that I'm wondering is, so, you know, white it's, it's a little lower to the ground. Um, it's got smaller creatures. It swarms a bit better. It might have a, you know, chance of kind of killing you a turn quicker, maybe than some of these mono green decks do. One of the most interesting things in my mind is, you know, Elite Spellbinder being such a disruptive card against so many decks that are slightly slower. You know, if you can just like tag the right, if you can tag the Asika's Chariot out of your opponent's hand at the right time, if you can tag the Lolf, right? If you can just tag, you know, whatever, um, whatever bridge your blue red opponent was looking to, you know, get between turn four and turn five of the game, perhaps try to get the game going long enough to hit that Allrun's Epiphany. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm really interested to see whether Mono White has a showing at Worlds um, because it's definitely been a strong ladder deck and seems to have put up some reasonable finishes in some of these SCGs as well. Um, I think, you know, Mono Green, just based on what I've seen on the ladder and like what I see in these tournament results looks like it's going to be one of the decks to beat. And it looks like it's going to be a deck that everyone's trying to uh, play around. And the good news is that I think mono green is quite beatable. Maybe it's something that the three of us share that I think all of us have been gravitating towards lists that, you know, do a fairly good job of beating up mono green. So it's always a little surprising to me when I see it dominating tournaments like this, just because the kind of decks that I like to play don't usually struggle in that matchup very much. So what I'm wondering, this is what I'm wondering, is if we're actually going to see more of these kind of mid-rangey or more of these kind of controly lists coming into uh, worlds because, you know, you can just, I mean, Michael J has been kind of, kind of talking about it for the, for the whole show, right? Where you can have this plan where you kind of decisively crush deck, uh, lists like Mono Green, while at the same time having enough trump cards uh, to make some of these like blue decks really squirm, right? Um, cards like Test of Talents, for example. So that, that's one of the things that I'm most interested in is if we're going to see, you know, like the right Demir control list or if we're going to see like the right blood on the snow based list, which kind of has the trumps to be able to get ahead in, in all of the slower matchups. Michael J. 
I think you also have to consider the players. Like it's not like you know, sixteen random players, mm-hmm. uh, is it particular players. Uh, you know, didn't Paulo win worlds last time with a blue white control deck, right? You're talking about Gabriel Nassif, who's like an, an OG blue white control player. Um, if it if it's me making prediction on what's going to show up at worlds, I think uh, not just based on mathematical incentives, which I do think are there, but also just based on the players. You can see an over index of of black blue and blue white decks. Uh, and the these are my these are my thoughts. I think black blue. If you want to, if you think that mono white and mono green are real decks, and those are decks that you have to have in your consideration set, um, is there a better deck to play than black blue? Uh, I don't see anybody beating four meat hook massacre four divide by zero. That's like, I don't, I don't understand how, like, your, your game plan is to put a bunch of guys with three or fewer toughness in play. Like, I have four meat hook massacres, and God forbid something was bad was going to happen to me. I can divide that or I can divide my thing, right? And my divide is actually going to get me the teachings I need to keep going or the mascot exhibition that I need to to close out the game, right? So uh, that's really powerful. And I think that Black Blue has the additional incentive of, um, Siphon Insight being the best, like among the best cards, I think like it's hard for me to, to tell which is better, Ashmouth Dragon or Siphon Insight against other control decks. Like the uh, Siphon Insight was a card I completely missed when I when I looked at the at the Innistrad Midnight Hunt spoiler. I was like, oh, this is just kind of a weird think twice. Yeah. Is what was my initial thing? And I didn't realize what its long game implications were at the time. Like one of the one of the limiting factors in control mirrors, it, 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 this is inclusive of black based control decks, you know, like blood on the snow decks is you can only have seven cards in hand, right? Like you're often in like a late game situation where discarding a mascot exhibition. because you have too many cards, right? You're like law thing up, you're onyxing up, right? And the blue decks are doing other stuff, right? They're deluging, they're faithful men and whatever. They, they have other ways to accumulate hand. Siphon insight gives you three separate hands, right? Like the insight itself goes into the graveyard. So there's additional access to, to hand but then you have this whole other zone which is neither the graveyard which can be hit by eye tyrants which can be hit by go blanks and like especially if you think that the term is going to over index towards control decks there's this random element to siphon insight where like okay you only have x number of to fairies in your deck or you have like four hours with me how does your likelihood to win a game change if of the four Alarons Epiphany that you have, I just stole one? What if I stole two, right? Mm-hmm. With one Siphon Insight. Uh, the other thing is, which is very subtle about the card, but I think is profoundly powerful, is that if you think about Think Twice as a card that I've always loved, you know, um, since it was first printed, is a kind of the self-contained card advantage thing that helps you draw land on turn two. Siphon Insight is twice as good at helping you to draw land on turn two because you get two looks instead of one. Uh, and then if you're going to flash it back, you know, you get additional two looks to get land. So I think that card is, is just profoundly powerful to play in a deck if you think that you're not going to be under pressure because your opponent is playing a blue-white deck or a, another blue-red deck or something, you're not under, under damage pressure. At the same time, if you're under pressure, there's nothing better than... Divide by zero, Meat Hook Massacre, 4x, 4x. Like, Divide by zero as a point removal card is outstanding here, right? Somebody blows a bunch of resources to cast an Asika's Chariot or cast a, uh, a Ren and Seven, and you divide it and then untap with, like, five mana in play. They are in trouble, buddy, right? Like, that's, that is really, I think, Black Blue's awesome from that perspective, and I think it has really great sideboard options as a result of being Black, right? So that's one thing. I think blue white is very different, but it has a, a really powerful incentive that I wish you could mash all these things together. The dual lands support it, but the fields don't. So I was just like, oh man, can we take the best elements of red, black, and white and put them into like some sort of cosmopolitan blue deck? And the answer is no, because you won't have enough field of ruin support if you, if you do this. Yeah. But faithful mending is very quietly just the best card ever for a deck that has highly pinpoint specialized cards. So like oftentimes you're like, okay, I have a sunset revelry, but I'm playing against black blue. This card is atrocious against black blue. Well, faithful mending lets you get rid of it at a a minuscule cost and it pays for itself later. Right. Yep. The same thing is true. If you've got a test of talents and you're like, okay, 
I'm going to get rid of this. I'm, I'm just, you know, that, that much deeper to get to my doom scar. And I got two life in the process. So if you want to play like very extreme cards, like Sunset Revelry, Devastating Mastery, cards that are absolute haymakers in some matchups and have no text in other matchups, Faithful Mending is unbelievable there. If you want to have a deck that uh, has a card, Siphon Insight is incredibly powerful against control and then has the best game plan against go-wide creature strategies, Black Blue is unbelievable there. Um, both decks have uh, the access to Test of Talents. Main. You can go to four Test of Talents sideboard if you want to. You are probably not going to lose to Blood on the Snow or Aaron's Epiphany based decks if you, if you have access to those tools. And then there's Blue Red. Here's the thing about Blue Red. If I were going to play a Blue Red deck in this tournament, which has 16 players, not 1,200 players, no way am I trying to take the extra turns. There is an egg in play on turn two, and I don't even worry about their long game, right? Like, because they can't beat my egg. Like, yeah. that's the thing, right? If they don't have another catalyzing dragon, they can't even kill the egg, right? Like, that's crazy, right? Like, this is a stupid 04 Delver of Secrets, you know, time bomb is going to sit there and it's not going to take very long to flip. Like, the first time I saw the thing in action, it kicked my butt and I was just like having all these creatures and it just killed all my creatures and then attacked my planeswalker. I was just like, there's just no way out against this thing. You have to kill it. And like, it's done so much damage to you, whether it's damaged to your life total or like the amount of material that it just gobbles up for nothing. Consider kill that, you know, like, you know, whatever cantrips kill that. I think that there's an incredible incentive to, to blue red just for that card. I mean, obviously expressive iteration is a good card, but I mean, is expressive iteration better than, than siphon insight? I don't think so. I think Siphon Insight is far, far more powerful than exp Expressive Iteration if if you're not trying to set something particular up, right? If you're going to set up particular cards in your deck, then exp Expressive Iteration is better. If you just like randomly want to draw cards and, and get some some sort of upside potential, including, you know, tucking cards, right? It's expressive, expressive Iteration is tucks cards kind of badly, right? Sometimes you're like, oh, I, I just lost it, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> then Siphon Insight is far superior, but that that egg, man. I, it's mind blowing to me how good. So each of those color combinations has a two mana spell that makes it like a really compelling case, especially for that room, right? And I, I think there's going to be a profound over index towards blue white just because, you know, there's legendary blue white players amongst those 16, right? And, you know, players at that level are probably not trying to identify themselves with the particular archetypes, right? It's not like, me winking at you and then always having a monastery with spear in my deck, right? Like these guys are playing for four hundred thousand dollars or something, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like they're actually going to try to, you know, like how how many gems do they need to uh, to invest? <laughs> as many as <laughs> like it takes. I, you know, yeah, <laughs> to make a hundred thousand dollars, we're like, you know, ninety nine thousand dollars in gems is is going to be within is going to be within their carrying capacity there. So, um, that's my thoughts. Uh, I would. There's gonna be some aggro players, right? You know, people mm -hmm. wink and they're like, oh, "I'm gonna aggro you." That's what I'm gonna do. And um, they're gonna to have to hope that they're not playing either against the Doomscar decks or the the Divide Meat Hook Massacre. I mean, every time I think about it, I'm just like, I wish I hadn't spent all those wild cards on you, sparring regiment. You, you <laughs> want some more hooks, huh? You want to get some more hooks? It's it's well so I, I I hate to put it this way right uh because I was in part inspired by your your Demir video right and I'm like he got so many things right and all of his conclusions are wrong <laughs> like Siphon Insight is the ace right like like you're like oh yeah you know you can just play consider I'm like no you can't this card. <laughs> is unbelievable that, that's what right? i like, get that's what i get for trying to appeal to the budget card the budget-minded players <laughs> you have three separate hands like, that's a lot of hands right? like, really good. and then he's like ah meat hook massacre is pretty good but don't worry about it just just play crippling fatigue like, no 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 you could pick this wrath back up and then cast <laughs> it again and gain five life right like that is much better than crippling fatigue I, I'm, also, never, you I'm never about, talking to budget players again. Never. It's, <laughs> we, but you're, 
you're playing like wallet destroying decks. Yes. Right. That's like right. your deck has 20 mythic rares in it. You can't appeal to yeah. the 20 is I've got to stay on brand. I apologize man. for saying only 20. No, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've got probably have like 56 rare and mythic rare cards in your deck. You don't get to be like you can play consider instead of the rare version. The rare version is much, much better than the common version in this case. The people the love three him. separate hands thing killed me, man. I was just like, <laughs> I, I like seven cards here, four cards over here, and then also the graveyard. Michael J, have you played Lear, the Drowned Disciple? Which one is that? Probably not. I've only played every the card. Deck. Every card in your graveyard gains flashback. Every instant no, sorcery in your graveyard. How much does that cost? It's five Lear. mana for a three four. Five mana three four. What color is it? Blue. Does it have flash? No, it doesn't Does have, have flash. hexproof. No, it doesn't can have it, hexproof. Can it phase? It cannot it's, phase. No, fa- fading hope. <clears throat> fading hope is what Leah has going for yeah. it. Yeah, fading hope. <laughs> yeah. So, so no. my my versions with uh, Leer that I've been really into now have four divide by zeros and four fading hopes. So when they but try to it, kill it, I just keep bringing it back. You're going to be so slow. Like when, when oh, are you going to cast that card on turn eight? Yeah. Yes. Minimum. Turn ten. <laughs> <laughs> let's go I, I'm, I'm just saying if it hits the battlefield on turn 10 and you were gonna play that long anyway it's like you draw your graveyard so here's the thing let's say you're playing your leer deck right and okay. your leer doesn't have any text for the first nine turns of the game let's say yep. you're playing against a control deck how many of the cards in their hand have text against leer a good right? amount so i mean, like all right this is a pretty exciting thing i if if it I'm tapping five on my own turn. <laughs> I have to win. Yeah, yeah, I have to win the initial yeah. counter war, and then I have to have XM. You don't even have mana open. They're gonna kill it before you get to flashback the first card. I think, but um, that's that's one thing. The other thing is that if I were to play, I was presumably black blue, right? Not the mm-hmm. blue white doesn't seem like a natural. Uh, I've either. done both. I like the blue white better, mostly for okay. mastery. I, I've watched your blue white video and I think that one sounded way better than the Lear one. Okay. I, <laughs> okay. I, I accept. I accept. I was mostly mentioning it because you like the three hands. If you see Lear in play, but, your hand is. Yeah, but so you're talking much. about a, an instant speed card that you could cast twice that costs two mana. You're comparing yeah. it to five cast that costs sorcery speed three, four. I just, and want the problem is, I just want all the above. If you have like. <laughs> And you're playing it in a deck where if somebody had point removal, they had nothing to point it at for the first two yeah. turns of the game. Like this not... is... Well, so supposing I, supposing you I bring think... it in as a breaker in the control mirror, right? You know, but if you're... your, your think... opponent thinks you're playing this literally creatureless blue white deck, may I don't know, maybe you kind of side in one or two copies, right? If you were any black deck, right? If you were a Blood in the Snow deck, if you were another black blue control deck or something, wouldn't you always bring in all the go blanks you had in your sideboard against blue white just for the value? Just cast it on turn three hmm. sometimes, right? Yeah, and like you might you might snag amending. Yeah, best right? of like, three so, is gonna have challenges there for sure. Like it's really bad if uh and just in Arjuna's example, right? If you're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna bank on this thing because it's it's dominated by the thing that you can expect the person that you're bringing this in against to already be playing cards that are good against those sure. kinds of strategies. So it gets hit by the splash damage is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. So yeah. I I don't know. That one seems like... I, so that I think you sometimes talk about this as a content play, right? When sometimes. you do it, you know, make it make a sizzle reel <laughs> of the time that you... Like, yeah. Here's 30 seconds of all the cool stuff I ever did with Lear in play. Like, yeah. cool, man. It might take you 40 games to get those 30 seconds, but <laughs> they're now there. Uh, I'm but I, so I, exposed right now. <laughs> I, I I don't know. Like uh, it, it seems to me that your the regular blue white you made. I was like, oh, that seems like a really good you know a good shell of a deck. I I, I think this is something that that we can work with. Um, uh, and I mean the devastating mastery is it's just such a paradigm changing card. It, yeah. it I feel very exposed. Um, as somebody who's been suckered into playing blood money strategies by you, how bad it is <laughs> to play against your your uh, uh, magic uh, st- actual standard in 2022 deck versus your uh, standard 2022 deck. 
<laughs> well, you know, that's what we try to do. Try to take it to the next level. You, you, you're you're moving those wild cards for Watsy. <laughs> I, I, when's my check coming in? I, I, know, I keep right? wondering. I keep <laughs> I keep watching the mail, and yet uh, they still don't they still don't pony up the dough. But there's no easy way to do it, guys. I think we got to call it a podcast. I this has been a ton of fun though. What what is our journey? It, it has it has my the only thing that we're missing, Kovac Go Blue, is I'd love to hear your predictions for Worlds because we haven't oh, yeah. we haven't gotten there yet. So let let's touch that quickly and then we can head on out. I think that control is better than it's been in a long time. And I think it will be overrepresented at Worlds in a way that it hasn't been kind of since Eldraine. I, I guess it was right after Eldraine was the last world championship and controlled like blue white. There were four copies in the 16 player tournament and it did like Paulo took it down. So maybe not since Eldraine, but it's been a while since control, I think was this good. And I think that the players in this love to play control. I would love to see Gabriel Nassif kind of going to the very minimal win con control list. Uh, always a reason I love to watch him. I do think there will be some dark horses in the event, uh, probably mono white. I, I think green will be underrepresented. Asika's chariot, I think, will actually be underrepresented. I think that Epiphany will hold strong. I think some people will identify it as the strongest ceiling on the format, and they're just going to try to build the best Epiphany decks. And then I but think something like mono white will get sneaky. Not necessarily a turns deck, right? Like not necessarily a, a turns deck. Like a yeah, blue, black, blue, white, or you know, dragons type deck that happens to have Epiphany. Is that what your prediction is? I think okay. I think that it'll be is it, and I think it'll have Epiphanies as an option somewhere. Probably not cut them entirely, but it won't be like a solo copy Epiphany strategy like we're seeing the thing that people yeah, thought I, would get banned. <laughs> I agree. I think it, you're likely to see like somewhere between eight and 10 dragons, including eggs and, and epiphany. I, I just, I mean, Ash Mother Dragon is just too good. It's it just, is really good. Yeah. I think that smoldering yeah. egg is your sleeper, your sleeper pick. I mean, you know, we have as kind of a juicy little preview of the format, Seth Manfield tweeting about, you know, he's building his, is it list and he's trying to decide between the chicken and the egg. Right. So <laughs> this is, this is what the pros are thinking about. So, yep. That's, I think, you know, which, which one comes first in your red deck, the chicken or the egg, that's going to be one of the questions we're trying to answer at the championship for sure. So I'm supposed to be the host and I'm supposed to have like, um, I'm supposed to know how to do outros and things, but I've had go blank cast on me a few times this <laughs> podcast and it's not there. So I, Arjuna, will you take us the rest of the way? I, I will be happy to do so. Um, so first of all, just wanted to thank you so much, Michael J. Flores, for coming on the podcast. Um, I mean, just having someone of your your breadth of, of history with magic and your caliber of thinking is just an absolute honor and a pleasure. So first things first, uh, Michael J., where can people find you on the internet? And uh, if there's any content that you've been making lately that you want to highlight, this is a great place to do so. Uh, so uh, I guess the easiest access to me is probably on twitter i'm five with flores f-i-v-e-w-i-t-h f-l-o-r-e-s on twitter um and yeah i log in every day although uh, i don't i'm not as 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 tweety as a, maybe i once was uh, but i'm there and then i publish an article on cool stuff inc most weeks uh usually on tuesday morning uh and i just started a little kind of like of audio versions of, of some uh there's one episode up so far uh but uh I, i'm kind of like gonna rejuvenate it like my ancestor recall podcast from a few years ago uh that um that's just launched last week and i have other podcasts that let's say are you know maybe a little hiatus right now but i'm sure that all they will all come back uh at some point uh and i certainly talk with all of my collaborators about the next time we'll, we'll record one who are these luckily all my friends in real life too awesome awesome um so yeah i mean you know w one of those podcasts top level podcasts is a podcast i've been listening to for years definitely hoping that that one comes back just go ahead and add that to your podcast feed and the next episode that shows up will feel like christmas time yeah so um, uh i i also would like to see that one come back so <laughs> Nice. So maybe we maybe this needs to turn into a, a Patrick Chapin bothering kind of a podcast. But anyway, we'll we'll give him a rest. Don't that was just a joke. Don't actually to be <laughs> go fair, we went like something like seven years without yeah. missing a week. So, so uh, 
yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's allowed. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like top eight magic, which goes, <laughs> goes years without an episode. I, I think uh, I, I'm totally okay with uh, giving rest. Patrick's working on some other creative projects and he just wanted to focus. So, I mean, we certainly, I mean, you know, we would have said something if we really planned to shut down or anything, but he's just like, I yeah. actually want to focus on something else. And like I said, I think we went seven years without missing a week. So uh, yeah, that's impressive. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it'll, it'll probably be back, but you know, I'll, I'll let everybody know when that's the case. <laughs> Subscribe awesome. to top level podcast. It's coming back. It's coming back. Baby. Someday. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you can find us in all the usual places. You can find us on Spotify. Uh, we're on iTunes. We're on all of your regular podcast platforms. You can watch the video version of this podcast on Covert Go Blue's YouTube channel. You can catch Covert Go Blue streaming regularly on twitch.tv forward slash Covert Go Blue. You can find me streaming somewhat intermittently on Arena Craft Podcast on Twitch. And, uh, yep, yeah, just can't wait for world's tournament so cgb and i will be back in the coming weeks with predictions and then revelations from from that tournament so if you want to get like the latest and greatest information about what's actually happening in the meta what some of the top minds in magic are figuring out then you'll definitely want to be tuned in for these next couple of weeks so i will look forward to it then cgb i will see you next week and uh michael J. just have a great week, and I'll keep looking forward to seeing your content out there in the world. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Later, crafties. All right. Yeah.